Hello everyone. This is a tutorial on electrophysiology, specifically talking about cable properties. I'm David Brown, professor in the physiology department, and this is a tutorial designed to help students understand how charges can flow through tissues of different properties. It is anticipated and hoped that this tutorial will aid in your understanding of concepts that are presented in neuroscience as well as in physiology. One of the things that we discussed when we talk about the spread of charge through tissues is that it's often like a wave of dominoes that falls and that the first domino that falls is what kicks it all off. In tissues, these are graded potentials. So to refresh your memory, graded potentials are found at synapses of one nerve with another nerve or with one nerve with a muscle, for example, like a skeletal muscle or the heart. Graded potentials are small local changes in the membrane potential that spread throughout a cell. In this example, we have one axon terminal here that synapses with a postsynaptic neuron and that the graded potential is generated ultimately leads to the influx of a positively charged ion like sodium. In this case, this would be an excitatory postsynaptic potential or an EPSP and the sodium or positive charge that comes into the cell would spread throughout the cell over time and over space so that the strength of the potential and the amplitude of the graded potential wanes as you get further and further away from the synapse. The analog that we like to talk about is to drop a rock in a pond. The size of the wave would be very high where the rock first entered the water and the size of the ripple would then decrease more and more the farther and farther you got away from where the rock went into the water. We talked about the concept of a trigger zone in an axon where you can have a stimulus that comes down, leads to excitatory postsynaptic potentials, and that that depolarization would spread through the tissue getting smaller and smaller, but if it was still more positive than the threshold potential at the axon hillock, then that would lead to the opening of voltage-gated channels and the influx of positive current ultimately leading to the action potential. Today I want to talk specifically about what determines how charges will flow through cells or through nerves. In this case we're looking at one neuron. You can see the dendrites here in the cell body. We've got the axon hillock or the trigger zone here and then the axon that you can see here. So we can think about really three ways that positive charge would flow through cells. And I just want to talk about positive charge for simplicity. So let's just assume that we're talking about excitatory postsynaptic potentials or the influx of a positive charge into the cell. What happens once that positive charge goes into the cell? Well, there's three options. The first is that it can just leak right back out. So the charge can come into the cell, flow a little bit through the cytoplasm, and then just leak back out of the membrane through an open channel. The second thing is that the charge can flow through the cytoplasm, and in many ways this is what we want to happen. We want the charges to flow down tissues leading to some sort of neurological or physiological response. In this case, it would flow down, hopefully, to the axon hillock, give enough positive charges that you're uh, more positive than the threshold voltage, and lead to the action potential. Finally, the charge can be stored by the membrane, and this is the concept of capacitance that we discussed in physiology, where the charge can go, but it will stay by the cell membrane and not progress any farther. So I want to explore these three concepts in a little bit more depth for the purpose of today's tutorial. These re collectively are referred to as cable properties. So they're f three biophysical parameters that influence changes in membrane potential in nerves and in cells. The first cable property is called membrane resistance. This refers to the ability of charges ions to move from the inside of the cell out of the cell. The second is called internal resistance, or R sub I. This is also called cytoplasmic, or you may also hear it as axoplasmic resistance. This refers to the ability of charges or ions to move through the cell cytoplasm. Finally is the property of membrane capacitance, which, which we've talked about a little bit before. This is the ability of the membrane to store charges. So let's get things started talking about membrane resistance. Membrane resistance, or R sub M, is when charges inside the cell can leak out of the membrane. So this is one example where a charge started to flow through the axon or down the axon and then just leaked back outside of the membrane. 
An important concept to remember is that with membrane resistance, the more membrane that you have, the more area that there is to leak charges. And so that means that larger cells have lower membrane resistance. The charge is more likely to leak out of a larger cell than it is out of a smaller cell. The second cable property to discuss is called internal resistance, or R sub I. Internal resistance refers to the ability of charges to spread through the cell or through the nerve. A metaphor that I like to think about is this one. Let's say that we have two faucets, and those faucets are attached above two different cylinders. The cylinder on the left is filled with big rocks or gravel. The cylinder on the right would be filled with sand. If we had the same amount of water or the same current of water going in each of these cylinders, you can imagine that gravity would pull the water down in both cases, but yet the cylinder on the left would have a lot more water that would be able to come through than the cylinder on the right. To think about this differently, we would say that the cylinder on the left has a lower internal resistance than the cylinder on the right. This would have a higher resistance because it's more difficult for the current or the water to pass through. One of the concepts that we'll discuss is that increasing the size of the cell decreases the internal resistance. Finally is the property of membrane capacitance, and we talked about this a little bit in physiology. To remind you, a capacitor is something that has the ability to st store charge. The technical definition is it's two conducting plates that are separated by an, insular, uh, by an insulator. And so cell membranes make great capacitors. The lipid bilayer that separates the inside and the outside of the cell is very resistant to charge flowing, so it's an insulating material, and yet charge can flow very nicely in the water-soluble compartments on the outside and on the inside of a cell. Remember that capacitance is a lot like the term capacity of a room, for example. So capacitance is directly proportional to the size of the axon or the size of the cell. The bigger the cell, the bigger the capacitance, and vice versa. Capacitance is also inversely related to the difference separating the two plates. So if the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell are functionally farther away from each other, the capacitance will go down. One of the examples that we talked about is if we had a game to get from this point over to the finish line, and then in order to go from left to right, we had to first fill the dots. If this, dots, if this top green circles had a capacity of two dots per circle and we started, and the bottom had a capacity of ten dots per circle and we started, you can imagine that it would be much slower to fill the ten dots down here than the two dots up in this example. And so we would fill two dots, two dots, two dots, and two dots, and we would finish, finish very quickly. So the metaphor that I want to get home is that if the capacitance is low, it's easier for a wave of dots or a wave of depolarization to progress, in this case, from left to right. So the green would win in this race. Before we move on, let's take a quick concept quiz. I want to ask you the question, think about it, and then you can pause it before we go on to the next slide, which will have the answers. What effect would changing cell size have on each of the three cable properties? Let's first start with membrane resistance. A larger cell has a larger or smaller membrane resistance than a smaller cell or neuron. Second, a larger cell has a larger or smaller internal resistance than a smaller cell or neuron. And finally, a larger cell or neuron has a larger or smaller capacitance than a smaller cell and neuron. Once you've worked through that, then think about these bullets, which are a little bit harder. Would the, the increase in size make the charge more or less likely to propagate down the cell based on what happens with the membrane resistance? Would a larger cell be more or less likely to have an action potential propagate down the cell based on the uh, internal resistance? And finally, how would the capacitance influence the ability of charge? Would it make it more or less likely to propagate down the cell? So what I'd like for you to do is think about each of these three questions, pause it if you need to, and when you're ready, we'll move on. So as we talked about before, a larger cell or neuron has a smaller membrane resistance than a smaller cell or neuron. 
That means if it has a smaller resistance here, it is less likely to propagate down the cell in a larger neuron. So a larger cell or neuron has a smaller membrane resistance. Secondly, a larger cell has a smaller internal resistance than a smaller cell or neuron. This makes it more likely that the charge will propagate down the cell. So if the cell is larger, that means it has a smaller internal resistance. If the resistance is smaller, it's more likely for current to flow. Finally, a larger cell or neuron has a bigger capacitance, as we've discussed, than a smaller cell. This makes it less likely that the signal would propagate down because some of the charge is more likely to stay by the membrane and not propagate all the way down the cell. I want to talk specifically about the internal resistance when it relates to the cell size. So let's say that we have this example here. We've got one larger neuron on the left and a smaller neuron on the right. You can see if we took a cross-sectional area of any portion of this neuron, we would have a larger radius or larger diameter for the bigger one than we would for the smaller one. For this, a little bit of math has to come in, but I promise I won't get carried away. If we think about axons as being like cylinders, each of them would have a radius, and then the axon would have a length. For any given uh, cylinder here, the membrane area can be estimated by multiplying 2 times pi times the radius multiplied by the length of the cylinder. Whereas if we wanted to estimate what the volume of, it would be pi times the radius squared times the length. So because of this, the volume is a function of the radius squared. That means that any change in cell size has the biggest effect on the internal resistance. So what does all of this mean? Remember the internal resistance is represented representing the cytoplasm. And so that means it's the uh, entire volume which is full of cytoplasm. The membrane resistance and the capacitance are only happening at the membrane and so that's why we look at the membrane area here. The punchline is is that anytime you change the size you will change the volume more than you will change the membrane area whether you get bigger or whether you get smaller. The membrane volume will have the biggest effect so that's why the internal resistance can be so important. If we think about this then, when nerve conduction by size, let's say we have the same presynaptic nerve that is synapsing with a smaller postsynaptic neuron and a larger postsynaptic neuron. The smaller postsynaptic neuron has a higher internal resistance, it has a higher membrane resistance, and it has a lower capacitance. The larger postsynaptic neuron has a lower internal resistance, a lower membrane resistance, and a higher capacitance. When you put all of this together, because the internal resistance, the cytoplasm volume would change the most with size, changing the size of the cell or the neuron lowers, in this case increasing the size of the cell or neuron, lowers the RI more than it changes the other variables like capacitance. This means that smaller unit motor units or smaller neurons will often be recruited first, and this is referred to as the size principle. In this case, we have uh, neuron W that's coming down the spinal cord. It synapses with a small motor unit X, medium-sized motor unit Y, and big motor unit Z. In this case, X would be the smallest, and so the small neurons have very small axon diameters. They're easier to depolarize to threshold. They have a lower capacitance. They have a higher membrane resistance, and so they're activated first. One of the metaphors that helps me think about this sometimes is if we had two beakers full of water. Let's say beaker A had 10 milliliters of water and beaker B had 100 milliliters of water. If we only put 10 drops of blue ink in each of the beakers, the smaller volume would have a much higher change in color. And so beaker A with a very small volume would see a much greater change in color with any given amount of ink. This is similar to what we see with charges flowing, flowing through the tissues. Smaller neurons have shorter diameters between their cell bodies and the axon hillock. It's more likely that the impulse will get to the hillock and, and generate a membrane potential, so they're activated first. Larger motor units are recruited last, and so in this case, Z would be the largest motor unit 
The axon diameter is big. It's harder to depolarize at the threshold because it has a higher membrane capacitance and a lower membrane resistance, so it requires greater synaptic input. Often what you would see here in the case of motor units, if we looked at the development of force or tension on the y-axis, and this was um, the uh, excitatory input here, you would often see that we would activate the smaller motor unit first, generating a little bit of tension, and then on top of that we would then add the medium size and the larger motor units with a greater amount of um, drive coming from the spinal cord. So this is the size principle. Smaller motor units are recruited first. Finally, I want to talk about nerve conduction velocity where we can think about the influence of both the size and also the importance of myelin. Let's start here with a small unmyelinated neuron. As we've talked about, these unmyelinated neurons have, small neurons have higher uh, internal resistance, higher membrane resistance and lower capacitance. They're recruited sooner and the conduction is slower in these types of um, neurons and the slow conduction here really relies again on the fact that the um, uh, resistance, the internal resistance, is, uh, is the highest. If we increase the size of this unmyelinated neuron, the internal resistance would go down, which would help us with conduction. The membrane resistance would be a little bit lower since we got bigger, and the capacitance would be higher since the neuron got bigger. So comparing this neuron to this neuron, conduction would be slightly faster. Finally, let's think about a large myelinated neuron. In this case, the large myelinated neuron would have a low internal resistance, just like this big neuron. But the myelin now would uh, lead to a very high membrane resistance, making it much less likely that current would go across the membrane since it's wrapped uh, in the myelin. It also now has a very low capacitance since the myelin has, in effect, increased the distance between the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell. The point is, is that since you have a very low capacitance, and a very high resistance for charge to leak out of the cell, you have very fast, very efficient conduction. That conduction goes down the nerve, and as we've talked about, the conduction is amplified at each of the nodes of Ranvier, where you have very high density of voltage-gated sodium channels. Finally, we just talked about in class, just to refresh you, one of the problems with um, multiple sclerosis is that you have a degeneration of the myelin sheath, that leads to an increased capacitance. It makes the membrane resistance go down, so current is less likely to um, uh, propagate, more likely to leak out of the membrane or to stay by the membrane. And all of this leads to many of the symptoms that are associated with multiple sclerosis. I hope that this tutorial on the cable properties has been helpful for you. As always, please let myself or any of the other faculty know if you have questions. Thank you very much.